I'm going to start out telling you what I'm not going to preach about. Um, it's a little something my old preaching professor called sweeping the floor. Sometimes when you have a passage read and there is something in the passage that you don't tend to address, you just kind of keep moving. Sometimes there's something in the passage that catches the ear enough that it leaves people wondering, well, I wonder what he's going to do about that. Um, and the answer is nothing. Um, on that last part of the passage where Jesus says, which one of you who has a slave, slaves working, comes in, do you say sit down and eat? No. Serve me, then you can eat. And I think our modern sensibilities are Mine are offended enough that I, mean, I wish Jesus had tackled the whole problem of slavery in that day or treatment. That wasn't the point of the parable he was telling, even as we maybe wish he had. So what was he trying to say? And I just offer this and then we're going to move on. I think it had something to do with sense of entitlement. Sometimes we see people of faith today who live their faith in large public ways who expect to be appreciated for it, who expect privilege to come out of their faithful Christian service and are pretty proud about how humble they are. Um, I think Jesus is calling us to true humility, to understanding what our duty to God is. And when we offer it, have no expectations. We have, we have offered it. It is an offering. And we recognize that it is just what we should have done. So enough of that part of the scripture. We'll move on to what I really came to talk about. And I have to confess that it feels a little lame to have been in ministry for nearly four decades and to have been a Christian a lot longer than that and to find myself going to the Bible dictionary for a definition of faith. I mean, would you leave your car in the care of a mechanic that had to look up carburetor in the dictionary? <laughs> But the way Jesus talks about it, faith, not carburetors, uh, it makes me think that I don't really understand faith at all. Because what he says is what we just read. The disciples say, increase our faith. And Jesus says, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Anybody who is inclined to try and take everything in the Bible literally may have wasted many an hour on some supernatural tree removal. And I suspect with not very good results. I think the five-year-old who said this about one of Jesus' sayings maybe had it right. He didn't really mean that. He just said it that way to make it more interesting. It is interesting. So interesting that it makes me wonder if I understand faith at all. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, I may be asking some of you to date yourself. How many people had a mustard seed necklace growing up? All right, uh, the little round ball with a mustard seed in it, the plexiglass, whatever, what had some magnifying properties so that you could actually see the seed in there because it was tiny, tiny. Um, somebody told me after last service that uh, they used to stick theirs in their mouth and suck on it, and uh, one day the uh, seed sprouted uh, inside of the thing. Uh, could have been a mulberry tree, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, if you had that much faith, you could do mighty things. I went looking for what other people had to say about faith. Someone said, faith 
is the remaining recourse when a person reaches the end of their knowledge before the end of their journey, which sounds about right, the way we usually approach faith and God. When all else fails, well, try a little faith. Faith as sort of the duct tape of life. I don't know what else to do. I'm out of ideas, so maybe God? I like a little better what Martin Luther King Jr. said. Faith is taking the first step when you don't see the whole staircase. Or this one from Clarence Jordan. Faith is the turning of dreams into deeds. And here's what that Bible dictionary had to say. Faith, it said, is trust in or reliance upon God who is trustworthy. Faith, trust in or reliance on God who is trustworthy. Give us more faith, the disciples say. How do you even measure faith? How do you know when you have a little or you have a lot? How would you score yourself on the faith scale? Just a little dab, uh, fair to midland, whole bunch of faith? I don't know. Are there people who think they have a bunch and maybe don't have much at all? Are there some who think they don't have that much and really have a bushel basket full of it? Just don't recognize it. Give us more faith. They were feeling a little faith anemic, I think, because Jesus had just told them to forgive seven times in one day. Not seven different people, I forgive you and I forgive you, I forgive you, like Oprah handing out cars, you get a car and you get forgiven. And no, one person seven times. If the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. And the disciples, when they've had a moment to really let that sink in, say, huh, not just once, Lord, this is requiring more than one hand. Uh, increase our faith. So, do the disciples have any faith at all? It would be easy to read the English translation of these verses and conclude that Jesus believes that they have scored a big fat zero on the faith test. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, he says. But the Greek language tells a different story. There are two kinds of if statements in Greek. One is, if you had faith, and you don't. The other is, if you had faith, and you do. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, and it's that kind of if, the second if. If you did, and you do, Jesus implies, whether you know it or not, you could say to this tree, be planted in the sea. Give us more faith, they say. And he says, oh, but you do have faith. And a little, a little goes a long way. A tiny little seed of it can do mighty things. Use what you have. Author Madeline Lingle said one time, slowly I have realized that I do not have to be qualified to do what I am asked to do, that I just have to go ahead and do it, even though I can't do it as well as I think it ought to be done. This is one of the most liberating lessons of my life. For all of the recovering perfectionists in the congregation, raise your hand, no. Uh, let me read that one more time. Slowly I've realized that I do not have to be qualified to do what I'm asked to do. I just have to go ahead and do it, even though I can't do it as well as I think it ought to be done. 
This is one of the most liberating lessons of my life. We usually think of doubt as the opposite of faith, but I don't know many people of faith who don't have their doubts. Theologian Paul Tillich likened faith to courage. So that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. Paralyzing fear. People of faith, those who trust in God, go ahead anyway. They aren't particularly qualified. They may not have complete certainty. They may not be able to do it as well as they think it ought to be done, but they go forward anyway. Think about Abraham and Sarah. They didn't have a clue where they were going, but they set out for the promised land anyway. They weren't given GPS coordinates, a full color map. Go to a land that I will show you, is all they were told. And they went. And along the way, they laughed in God's face. And then they went ahead and had that promised son, and they named him Isaac. Laughter. Faith is the courage to act. And courage comes from a relationship. Courage comes from a relationship. Frederick Buechner said, I have faith that my friend is my friend. It is possible that all his motives are ulterior. It is possible that what he is secretly drawn to is not me, but my wife or my money. But there's something about the way I feel when he's around, about the way he looks me in the eye, about the way we can talk to each other without pretense and be silent with one another without embarrassment that makes me willing to put my life in his hands as I do each time I call him friend. I can't prove the friendship of my friend. When I experience, it does not need proof. When I don't experience, no proof will do. If I tried to put this friendship to the test somehow, the test itself would spoil the friendship I was testing. So it is with the godness of God. You could say to this tree, I don't know anybody who's rearranged the landscape, moved a, a tree out to the sea. Or maybe I do. I know people who have given up a behavior or a habit that was draining the life right out of them when they weren't at all sure that they could. I know people who have forgiven someone after they have said that there is no way, never, not ever, uh-uh, never going to do it. I will not forgive. And then they did. Not just once, but maybe twice, maybe seven, maybe 70 times seven. I know people who, because they trusted in God, got out of bed another day when they really couldn't think of any good reason to do so. But they did. And they did. And one day, like a tree thrown into the ocean, the darkness lifted. They found a purpose. They were given life again. I know people who have looked temptation square in the face and there was a good probability that they would never, never have been found out if they had given in to the temptation. But in an act of courage, they said, no, that is not who I am. That is not who God is calling me to be. I know people who have taken the 
hard path of walking an ailing spouse or parent through the dark valley of illness and infirmity all the way to death. I know people who have opened their hearts to children who needed them, the the little and the least, when it would have been so easy to say, that's really somebody else's problem to solve. Do we need more faith? Maybe. I guess that's, that's our job, sort of. Faith forming, faith growing. But Jesus seems to be saying a good start would to be to use what you have. Tiny little mustard seed faith that it might be. Y'all remember the sitcom Cheers? Remember Norm? What happened when Norm walked in? Norm! I went to physical therapy and I felt like Norm. I walked in and they said, Ken! I guess two hip replacements and rotator cuff surgery earned you that, uh, I guess. Uh, I think it's a good thing. I learned something in those months of physical therapy. Sometimes what they ask you to do, well, at first it sounds simple, and then you try, and then you realize mm, that's not simple at all. Uh, Handing me a timer, 30 seconds, five times, stand on one leg. <laughs> and I, uh, my replaced hip did not like those instructions. And I grabbed hold of the chair in front of me a time or two during those 30 seconds. But time after time, week after week, month after month, and pretty soon I was like, ooh, ooh what else you want me to do, all right? Uh, over time, it, it happened. Doing those things again and again. And someone said... Faith is not ideas. Faith is muscle. It's muscle. Time and again, doing the next hard thing, it grows. It grows. May God help us to do what we're called to do as best we know how to do it, as lame as that may seem, until it's not. Let us pray. Oh God, help us. Help us to use what you've given us even as we strive for something more. You have blessed us and we know you are with us and that is all we need. So take what we offer and do your good work. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.